남자 좋아하는 거 아니야? 아, 아, 나 지향이 남자 취향. 맞아, 메인 좋아해. 어, 맞아. 남자 취향. 아빠, 아빠. 
Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love. For you are merciful, O Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this time that we can come together and worship you. We thank you for your unfailing love for us. We just pray that as we worship you today, that your spirit would be in this place and that you would fill each and every one of us and that we would worship you in spirit and truth. In your holy name, God. Amen.
Father, blessed be your name. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for coming to our world and saving us. Give us wisdom as we read your word today. And I pray for the pastor, for his word, speak for him. I also pray for all the people in Chonan area, for their safety on the road, and um, especially I pray for our professor, Terry Kay, for his soon recovery. I pray in your heavenly name. Amen. Our first reading from Isaiah. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depth of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on high on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. Our gospel reading is from John. Okay. I just have different numbers, just a minute. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. This is the word of the Lord. house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? I've been thinking a lot about life and how life is hard to explain. Life is hard to understand. Life is kind of funny. It seems like one moment everything is going really, really well. And then suddenly something happens and life is going really poorly. And then something else is going well and poorly. It's kind of like a vicious cycle from good things and bad things, bad things to good things. And I just think, if your life is going well right now, there is no guarantee that it's going to be going well tomorrow or next month. But on the other hand, if your life is going poorly, there's no guarantee that it'll be going poorly tomorrow. Things can change suddenly. I think I've been thinking a lot about life uh, because I'm going to be a father. And I think about my future child. And I want my child to be happy all the time. I don't want him or her to experience pain, suffering, heartbreak. But I know that he or she will. And I know that there's sometimes there's just nothing I can do about it. You know, I'm supposed to be like the big protective father. Things will happen that I will have no control over. <coughs> because pain is part of life. I think all of us here know that. I think we've all experienced pain in our lives. So I'm going to tell you the story of two men right now who both experienced pain in their lives. But the pain did not lead to failure. The first is a politician. I'm sure I'm going to describe some things that happened in his life. I'm sure some of you by the end will know who I'm talking about. Several times he lost his job. 
and he decided to become a politician. So he was defeated for the legislature in 1832. His business failed, 1833. However, things went well in 1834, he was elected to the legislature. But the next year, the sweetheart, his sweetheart, the love of his life, died. So the following year after that, he had a nervous breakdown. Then two years later, he was defeated with trying to win Speaker of the House. He was defeated in his nomination for Congress, but three years later, he was elected to Congress. But then he lost his renomination. He was rejected for being the land officer. And then five years later, he was defeated for the Senate. Two years after that, he was defeated in his bid to become the vice president. Two years after that, he was defeated again in his run to make the Senate. And then two years after that, he was elected president of the United States. And then, perhaps the most famous, in 2012, he was in a movie where he slays vampires. I'm, of course, talking about Abraham Lincoln. And the movie, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Slayer, it's a classic. No, just kidding. Um, but Abraham Lincoln, considered by most, or many, to be the greatest president in the United States history. But his, his own history is littered with failures and defeats. He was a man who understood failure. But he knew that that failure did not define him. It did not stop his dreams and amb ambitions. He knew that in the end, the goal, his goal, was worth it. It was worth all the time, all the energy, all the failures. Next, I want to talk about a religious man. This man was born into a rich family. He was well educated and he decided to dedicate himself to the Jewish religion. He studied, he studied under one of the top rabbis in the world and became one of the most well-respected Jewish men in all the known world. He was the best. He had money, respect, and a very good life. And then he realized he was living the wrong life. He threw it all away to follow some religious upstart. From then on, he would be outcast in the Jewish community. Several times he'd be thrown into prison. He went from a very good life to a very difficult life. But he said through it all that he was grateful for the new life he was living. I'm talking here about the Apostle Paul, who gave up his easy life when he decided to follow Jesus Christ. He went on to begin many churches on three missionary journeys, and he became, perhaps, the most influential figure in the early church. But his life was not easy. One of the church he founded, one of the churches he founded, was in the city of Philippi, and he wrote the book of Philippians to that church. So that's where we turn to today in our scripture, Philippians chapter 3. There we go. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. 
Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God, on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is a letter that was written by Paul as a pastor to his community. It was to his people, to people he cared about the most. Like I said, Paul had founded the church in Philippi, and he founded it, and he stayed with them, and he taught them. And everything was going really well. And then he left. He left the church at Philippi and continued on his journey. And when he left, life was good for the Philippians. And they thought, oh, this good life will continue forever. But now Paul has left. And things have not gone so well for the people of the church. There was this pain and failure that was setting in for the people. The church was being persecuted by the people in the city. And the people in the church were being led astray by false teachers who were preaching a false gospel. And the people in the church were turning against each other. And they were leading their own people in the church astray. In this passage, Paul warns them to avoid these evil dogs. And now, Paul sees the church from afar and sees their pain and sees their anger and sees their finding. And these are the people he cares about most in the world. And he doesn't tell them how to fix their problems. Instead, he tells them what it means to be a follower of Christ. 
first, he tells them to rejoice. Even when life is full of failure, God calls us to rejoice and to praise his holy name. This seems counterintuitive. When life is bad, I really, really want to you know, curse and yell and hide under my covers. But Paul tells us when we feel failure the most is when we need to praise God the most, when we need to rejoice the most. Because our love for Christ and Christ's love for us supersedes any of that failure. When the world is not treating us fairly, God still loves us and God is still faithful. Next, Paul reminds them that in Christ, it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter their status in this world. It doesn't matter who they were or what they've done in their past. Paul points to himself as an example. Talks about how he could boast of his religious greatness. But that sort of boasting, that sort of shouting about how great we are, how much we read our Bible, how often we go to church, how good of Christians our parents were, that sort of boasting serves nothing. Everything that has come before, before Christ, Paul is complete garbage. And not because those things in themselves are garbage, but because compared to what he has found in following Christ, those things are so much lower. He's so glad to toss away the old perks of his life. Because knowing Christ and living a Christian life is better than any titles you can gain or any respect you can have in this world. Following Christ makes everything else pair, pale by comparison. You know what really drives me crazy? People who always boast about how great they are. You know, and there's people who are so concerned that everyone around them knows how good they are, you know, uh, how rich they are, how popular they are, how talented they are. I've noticed that the people who are actually really talented and really gifted don't need to show off for everyone. They don't need everyone to praise them for how great they are. Because they are confident in who they are and what they can do. I read an old saying that if you're, if you're in a bar and there's one man who is telling everyone how many fights he's won, how good he is at knocking people out and punching them. That's not the man you have to worry about. You have to worry about the one who's sitting in the corner, not bothering anyone, not telling anyone, but has some scars on his knuckles. One of my favorite stories is of a man named Chuck Liddell. For, uh, for a few years, he was one of the most uh, feared mixed martial artists in the world. Mixed martial arts is when they get in that cage and they punch each other. 
He was a world champion. And he was known for knocking people out with one punch. And, interesting thing, he also used to, I don't know, probably still does, paint his toenails with nail polish. And I remember thinking, huh, you know, I could just imagine people being like, oh, look, look, it's a man wearing nail polish. He's, he's painting his toes. But who mocks a world champion fighter who paints his nails? Nobody. But the real reason I really like that story is because it showed me that this man, Chuck Liddell, he was confident and comfortable with who he was. He wasn't trying to impress people. And Paul says the same thing. It's dangerous to boast and pretend and try to impress people. Because knowing Christ is enough. Following Christ doesn't have to be showy. And it doesn't have to gain the respect of the people around you. Because it's real. We live our lives and we have good times and we have bad times. But if we live with Christ, we live with a righteousness that comes, not through the law, but through faith. Paul says that he would gladly participate in the sufferings of Christ, if it also means participating in the resurrection of Christ. I don't know if I would have added the word gladly in participating in the sufferings, but I think he makes it. It's better to suffer with Christ than to have a great life without Christ. And Paul admits that he has not yet succeeded. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. life is pressing on to be with Christ more and more. The calling that God has given to Paul is so great and so important that he is willing to toss away everything that has happened in his life before this time. So Paul presses on despite his failure. Paul Harvey, uh, he was a journalist and a radio commentator, was once asked how he achieved his success. And he simply replied, I get up when I fall. Following Christ does not change us so that we never fail. It does not protect us from mistakes and stupid decisions. In fact, it does not protect us from the evils of this world. It does not erase our past and protect us from the consequences of what we've done. But what it does is so much more our life in Christ teaches us about compassion, forgiveness, mercy. It reminds us and teaches us that no past failure is too big or too bad that God does not love us. And 
and no current pain in our lives, it's so painful that God cannot be with us in the last Here we are in the Advent season, focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ. And right now, we are in those weeks before Christmas where we are waiting, waiting for it to come, waiting for the Messiah to come. And the question that the Philippian church is asking about Christ is a very simple one. Is following Christ worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth the suffering? When Jesus was born, people were expecting a conquering hero who would lead an army. But Jesus wasn't that. And people expected a king to come and reign here on earth and rule over the land of the people. And Jesus wasn't that, at least here on earth. the idea of what it means to be successful and what it means to be a man. Success, success is found in righteousness through faith. Mother Teresa is a great example, one of my favorites, a great example of what it means to live a righteous life. Senator Mark Cassio tells the story of visiting Calcutta and seeing Mother Teresa visiting her ministry of the sick and dying. And he's asked her, how can you bear this load? And he said, I am not called to be successful. I am called to be We're called to be faithful. And so as we wait for Christ, we think to ourselves, is it worth the wait? Is it worth it, waiting for Christ to come, to arrive, to change everything? Yes. It's worth the wait. That's why when we need Christ, we put everything that we've done in the past aside and we press on forward to the Lord. The goal is to live our lives as Christ the Lord. Thank you for the peace that this holiday season is to bring to us. God, so many tragedies have been striking recently. Some that we hear on the news and some are kept silent. Some involve a community and some are just our own personal tragedies. God, I ask that you would make yourself known. Make yourself known to each person in this world. May we feel your love and feel your peace in this season. God, I ask that you would help us to find the joy in the life of the baby Jesus Christ. I thank you for this message that you brought to us today. And I ask that you would help us to remember the meaning of this season.
for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. And then Paul adds, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again.
celebrating the God who never lets us go as we celebrate Christmas. Tonight we have a Christmas concert, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. We have uh, people from all over the place uh, coming to sing. There'll be songs in English, there'll be songs in Korean. I think there'll be some songs with no words, uh, just instrumental songs. Uh, bring your friends, so come and celebrate. Uh, there's also some wonderful home-cooked food com coming. There's some baked goods already happening. Uh, just highlight a couple of them. I, I we volunteered our kitchen this weekend for Diana to make a double chocolate cheesecake. It's like this big from scratch. Come. It I told her I cannot promise you that it will be there on Sunday night because it's in our kitchen. I haven't eaten it yet. There's not even a slice out of it, I promise. Uh, but Sarah is threatening to tie me up so that it still makes it here tonight. Uh, so anyway, that will be, uh, there'll be a few things that are on auction, but most of the things will be uh, at the table in over, there'll be tables over here in this area where the, uh, the drink machines are, and those will be sold in individual servings. Uh, also, I've, I've heard rumors that some of our Korean ladies are making jeon 
bring it in their pan. Uh, and uh, it also, sometimes John is known as preaching day. So uh, come ready for uh, wonderful food from east and west tonight. And uh, good music. We've got music from around the world. We've got a group of KQ's uh, African students coming. Uh, they rock the house at a Thanksgiving banquet for the international students and faculty at KU a couple of weeks ago. And Sarah said, you've got to get them to come to our concert. So they're coming. And uh, by the way, when they play, you ought to be ready to dance because that is the kind of music that they're playing. And then uh, next, uh, next Sunday is our Christmas offering. 100% of the offering next Sunday goes for our partnership with Bangladesh where we're helping build a village for widows and orphans. And the next day, on Christmas Eve, we're having a candlelight Christmas Eve service, one of the most beautiful services of the year. Make sure you come. Also, it's a great time to invite your friends or family or neighbors or co-workers who don't go to church because it's a unique service. It's a short service. There's dessert afterwards, and there's even a movie afterwards. So I welcome your, your friends, your, your neighbors, people who are not from Korea are really missing their families at this time of year. This could be a great way for them to just feel like they're uh, experiencing some home-type traditions. So, making plans for that. Tonight, 6.30, right here in this room, Christmas concert. Next week, our final Advent service and the Christmas offering. And then Christmas Eve night at 7 p.m. is the Christmas Eve service. Now, receive the blessing. May we together hold on to the God who is holding on to us. May we never let go of the God who never lets us go. Go in peace to be a loving community that changes our world. Mm -hmm.